Alright guys, here's the industrial industrial revolution. It's quick, it's clean, and it's fairly straightforward. But the industrial revolution, like the political revolutions of the French Revolution in Haiti and South America and Mexico, are going to reshape the world. And it starts here, right in this absolutist period, where we've got some of these absolute monarchs either in power or just beginning to leave power on the eve of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and the Enlightenment. In around 1750, the Northwestern European economy slowly begins to industrialize. And this event is almost as game-changing as the Neolithic, Neolithic Revolution, the Renaissance, and the modern computer revolution. This is a game changer. It will separate Northern and Western Europe from the rest of the world. Shortly thereafter, the United States and North America are going to enter the game. And what industrial, industrialization does is it gives Europeans a large quantity of new goods and resources to sell. This in turn will create an international market where Western made, Western made goods, industrialized goods, will provide finished products in exchange for raw materials. Game changer is these raw materials will be extracted from other countries across the globe. Countries and continents, Africa, South America, and Asia are going to be pillaged to get these raw materials so industrialization can work. And the income that is created by this industrial revolution. Um, will create a lopsided balance of trade, heavily in favor of Western Europe. And it will allow Western European countries to dominate the globe for centuries to come. Now, it all begins here in merry old England. England is the leader of the Industrial Revolution until the late 1800s, where it is finally overtaken and eclipsed by the United States, simply because the United States has more raw materials. There were several reasons for the British being dominant early on. Number one is England is separated from continental Europe. All of the problems and conflicts and wars that go on in, you know, going back to Napoleon, well, they affect the continent, Spain, Portugal, Holy Roman Empire, Austria, a lot more than they do the physical territory of England. So England doesn't, you know, feel, experience many of the continent's problems. Secondly, England has a lot of raw materials, especially iron ore, you know, coal, things like that, things necessary for making iron. And... England is the largest free trade area in all of Europe. England has good infrastructure, roads, bridges, waterways that are clean and, well, not so much clean, but free and easy to move from. You don't have to pay tolls or taxes to cross from one county into the next or one over one bridge, like the troll living under the bridge charging you a toll. You can freely move about England. And what's very underrated is at this time, England's banking industry was probably the best in the world at the time. The ability to save money or extract money or letters of credit, England's leading the, the, the industrialized world in banking. And going through my six steps here, taxes. Taxes, while a little bit high, were always approved by Parliament. And while, again, they're on a little bit of the high side, they are fairly corrected. And so, at the start of the Industrial Revolution, there is also a large consumer demand for England's finished products. 
especially in its American colonies. Again, this is 1750, before the Revolutionary War, and England's colonies, not only in North America, but throughout the globe, gave them a steady source to ship their raw material, or to ship their finished products, rather, to gain a lot of money from their overseas colonies. So, anyhow, the Industrial Revolution is going to come down to new methods of production. And we're thinking of modern industry, large factories, you know, Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, you know, New York, Philadelphia, these big, giant, you know, Chicago, these industrial meccas. Well, the Industrial Revolution is always going to be deeply connected with the countryside. It'll start there, go to urban areas, and then boomerang back. And it starts... Um, because the Industrial Revolution starts with textiles, manufacturing of cloth, like clothing, cotton, wool, so on and so forth. And during the spring, the summer, and the fall, peasants would work the land. That was their job, to farm, to tend their crops, tend their herds. That was their main job. And then in the darkness and the coldness of winter, they would stay inside, where they would drink a lot of ale, a lot of mead, a lot of beer, and then they would get these stacks of wool that they had sheared from their sheep, and they would spin that wool into thread. In the springtime, you know, March, April, this time of year, large textile manufacturers would come by in a big wagon. They would buy the finished product, the, you know, wool spun into thread, and they would take it back to their factories. In this way, Industrial development takes place in the countryside because that's where the work was. The problem is this rural system of industrialization creates bottlenecks. There is a larger demand than the quantity of the product. You have to wait until spring to go by and purchase this wool. And when you've bought it all, there is no more to get for the next year. And with England's colonies growing, the demand for textiles begins to grow faster than the old rural ways of doing things. There's got to be a better way to meet this demand. North America was growing. We've got demand is, you know, more than the supply. So in 1769, a British inventor named Richard Arkwright is going to develop a water-powered spinning frame. Think of like Cinderella's spinning wheel, but mechanized, a giant wheel powered by water that had giant eyelets on it. Think of like a fishing pole, a big eyelet, then a smaller one, and a smaller one, and a smaller one. And the wool is pulled by this water power through these different eyes, thinner and thinner and thinner, until it is wrapped into a string of thread. This is a water-powered, 24-hour-a-day way to make cotton or wool into fabric or thread. So it's known as the spinning jenny. And that's great, all right, if you're next to water. Here's the old spinning jenny. Or think of your grandmother's old foot pumper sewing machine if you have one. You know, it's great to an extent. It speeds the process up, but it's not perfect. Mill machines are originally powered by water. Some are powered by wind, like think of, you know, Dutch windmills. But they depend on the forces of nature. They depend on the wind to blow, or to make sure the current is flowing at a steady rate. Too fast or too slow, it doesn't help you. So dependence upon this weather leads to, by far and away, the most important invention of the Industrial Revolution, and that is the steam engine created in Great Britain by James Watt. The steam engine was originally used as a pump, like a shop vac, to pump water out of coal mines, allowing miners to get deeper into a vein of coal. And so it works. And then Watt, you know, enlists the help of a couple other guys, a guy named Bolton and another guy, and they modify James Watt's system, his engine, 
not to just pump water out of mines, but to help move transportation. And so by the early 1800s, steam engines are going to be put on transoceanic vessels and steam railroad cars, the old steam engine, Thomas the Tank Engine. With this, steam engines become very quickly the main movers of heavy industry. Now, at the time, and this sounds kind of funny, walking, a human can usually get around 20 miles you know, per day. Riding a horse, you could do three times that. You could cover 60 miles in a day. Well, on the steam engine, people could go 20 miles in one hour. In three hours, you could go 60 miles. People were afraid to ride it early on. They thought it was so fast, the skin would fly off their bodies. Now, we go down the road to Weaver Dairy Extension, and for whatever unknown reason, that speed limit is only 25. You can almost get out and run that fast when you're driving on that thing. But that's how big of a game changer the Industrial Revolution was. And what that needs is the ability per, to produce high quality iron. And the great thing about the steam engine is that it doesn't get tired. You don't have to feed it. It doesn't get exhausted. You don't have to worry about it being too hot in the sun or too cold in the winter or too dark at night or or too wet in the rain. It can work 24 hours a day as long as it has power, wood or coal, to produce the steam. The big question is iron. High quality iron was much in demand. You need iron to make railroad lines, to make you know, you know, steam engines for the trains, for the railroad cars and steamships. And, at the end of the day, you need more steam engines. The problem was the current system of smelting iron was extremely inefficient. You've got to build a high heat to melt the ore out of rock. And now remind me on Monday and I'll pass around a piece of iron ore. This is called smelting and it was extremely inefficient. Well, James Watt's steam engine greatly improved the process. You could get a conveyor belt and you could regulate the speed where coal or wood is constantly fed into a giant brick or metal oven. All right, it's called a blast furnace. Right? My grandpa in Pittsburgh ran one for years. The steam engine was applied to blast furnaces. This gives it a constant rate of feed for the heat source. So the intensity of the heat is higher. This greatly improves the speed of smelting, and also it burns off the impurities so a stronger grade of iron is made. Then people pour it into a mold. Think of like the orcs in Lord of the Rings. People learn how to shape it, and it makes it even stronger and easier to use. It's now portable. Iron was now able to be shipped anywhere and everywhere. And this helps fuel the Industrial Revolution as it's applied to engines on boats and trains and now heavier and more material can be transported than ever before. So here's an early steam engine puffing its spoke, chug, 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 chug. More people, more material, more money. And so this is going to have an effect on the people and we are going to get a migration of people, a change in society. As old medieval towns that were important in the interior of countries in Europe are going to be abandoned. Think of people leaving like Cleveland and Detroit and coming to like Charlotte and Raleigh and Durham and Atlanta. You're leaving where the jobs were and going to where the jobs are. So... Industrialization in the steam engine causes changes in society. Cities are be going to begin to grow much larger. As you can see from this picture, it is a traffic jam. Like, where do you go? 
during the Middle Ages, most cities stayed relatively small. By the 1800s, however, cities are going to double in size. There is more people than there is infrastructure. Think of it trying to get to here to the airport or to downtown Raleigh. It takes forever. New cities are going to pop up. And the big stat is, by in 1500, there were only 13 European cities with a population of over 10,000. Only four had a population of over 100,000. But you can see from that dark picture, billowing smoke, things are about to change. Right? Four, four cities of a population of over 100,000. Well, by 1800, we have 363 cities that have a population of over 10,000 and 17 have over 100,000. Keep in mind, ancient Rome at its height had a population of a million. There are at least 11 cities in China at this time in 1800 that have a population of 1 million. So these cities are going to cause massive new urban populations. Industrialization creates jobs as it attracts people from the countryside who need employment. And again, these new cities are no longer located on the old medieval trading paths, traveling, you know, through like Nottingham or someplace like that. Instead, they move to the coastline where it's transoceanic shipping. In cities in England like Plymouth and Portsmouth and Hampton, Liverpool are going to take advantage of this. It's now ocean-going sea-based trade. Inland cities that were important at one time are now declining importance. Think of here in the United States, those of you who have moved here like me, from your Buffaloes and your Pittsburghs and your Youngstowns and your Erie PAs, your Clevelands, your Detroits, your Chicagos. Well, and that, you know, from 1950 to 19, or 1900 to 1970, they were important areas of industrial manufacturing. Now, those things are gone. And so, these inland cities, um, some of them are going to remain. They're not all going to become ghost towns. And some of them do remain vital to the growth during the Industrial Revolution. But when you get into a city, labor is much cheaper outside the urban areas. It's like buying real estate here in town or moving south to Chatham or to northern Orange County. You can get the same house for half the price. It's all about location. So business leaders begin to buy land out in the middle of nowhere. Look at Mebbin with Tanger Outlets, all right? You know, 10, 12 years ago, they didn't exist. That was a golf course. And look at Mebbin. It's blown up in um, business and in industry. And that's because when you build a factory, it attracts people. The workers who work in the factories, they need schools for their kids to go to. They need grocery stores to shop at. They need houses to live in. They need restaurants to eat at and theaters for entertainment. So it changes everything. An entire service economy develops around the factory since there is a large concentration of workers to feed and to take care of. And think like United Auto Workers. You know, Ford or GM in Detroit has to pay a UAW worker, you know, $25 to $30 an hour. So places like Toyota and Honda and BMW are buying um, land in like South Carolina and Georgia where they could pay, you know, Ricky Bobby, you know, you know $12 to $15 an hour. And he's thinking, yeah, I'm doing real good now. All right, it's my little South Carolina accent. Forgive me, people from South Carolina. But now... They think they're making a good living, but the automotive companies are saving themselves 50% on payroll. So you go out to the countryside where things are cheaper. So these things are going to totally change the social structure. All right? All right, this massive growth in urban areas creates jobs. The inland cities, as I said, are going away 
or staying stagnant while new cities grow. And even though inland cities don't grow rapidly, you can see here they're important to the Industrial Revolution. But it's the countryside where new factories are built and new towns grow around them. That is the important thing. So the social structure is going to change. Right. New cities and towns built by industrialization are going to cause a change in the social structure. On top of the social hierarchy are the old world nobles. Right, that's who they are. These guys have transitioned. They're now bankers and large big business owners and still the high ranking members of the clergy. These guys form oligarchies. And an oligarchy is a rule by a rich, powerful few. Say five to ten guys. And they dominate the economics of each town, the good old boy network. But, with this industrialization, with this new concentration of people and new towns, a new force comes into play, the middle class. Going back to Aristotle and the Gracchi brothers of Greece and Rome, he who controls the middle class is going to win. Well, it's now the bourgeoisie. <laughs> the bourgeoisie, a French term. Members of the bourgeoisie are people who are successful, but they are not overly wealthy. They're solid, they're good, but they're not exorbitantly rich. And on an individual level, they could not match the wealth of the upper classes. But if you take them from individuals and combine them in a chain, it was their strength in numbers that gave them power. United, they were more numerous and had more money than the rich. For years and years and years, they had been trying to become upwardly mobile in society, but they were blocked at every turn by those in power. They wanted their kids to get an education. They wanted their kids to go to school. And they want a choice in the government. But the nobles during the Industrial Revolution are going to hang on to power more tightly than ever before. But as the middle class swells in number, the aristocrats have a death grip on their ancient privileges. The middle class slowly begins to chip away and they acquire more power in society. The problem is, once the middle class makes it, kind of like we talked about in the French Revolution, they forget about where they came from. One of the largest criticisms of the middle class is that once they got power, they quickly tried to hold down or suppress the lower classes. Get a job, you slob. Do something to help yourself. Don't be a drain on resources. Now this is very, very strange and ironic because the middle class did not like being suppressed and looked down upon by the upper classes, but they quickly turn and do the same thing to the classes beneath them. And the group that suffers the most are going to be artisans, highly technically skilled labor. Skilled laborers are going to help build these factories. Carpenters, blacksmiths, stonemasons, printers. They had maintained their guild practices going back to the high Middle Ages. And within their guild, they were able to guarantee that each skilled worker who works inside their city will be able to get a specific price for a specific quality of an item. We're all going to charge the same rate and make the same quality of item. But now the Industrial Revolution threatens this position. Industrialization makes it for possible for an unskilled person or a factory to produce the same product much faster and much cheaper. And as such, it doesn't need to have as good of quality. So let's say that here we have, um, you know, Kevin is going to be our blacksmith. And Kevin makes really good horseshoes. 
It's a dollar per horseshoe. Kevin's horseshoes are guaranteed to last um, for six months. So it's four dollars um, every time your horse is shooed, eight bucks a year. But along comes King or you know Edward here. And Edward works in the Industrial Revolution, where he owns a factory, a factory that makes horseshoes. They're not as good as Kevin's. They don't last as long as Kevin's. They last two, maybe three months, but they're only 25 cents a piece. So Kevin's are high quality, and you got to spend eight bucks a year. But with Eddie's, they're only a dollar for a set of four. So every two months, I've, I've got to buy new horseshoes. Well, that's only six bucks. So I've saved myself two dollars a year. So I'm going to buy Eddie's, which are cheaper and made. They don't last as long, but I'm saving money. The, think of Charlie Bucket's dad in the new Willy Wonka. His job was a, was a toothpaste, tube cap, screw, or honor. And when we get a machine that does it, we no longer need that worker. And so these social classes are going to change. All right? A person's financial status is based on their working situation. On the bottom is going to be the proletariat, the unskilled laborers and the farmers, guys who don't have a skill like Charlie Bucket's dad. They are at the mercy of of the workplace. And that is going to bring about changes to the family. Family structures are going to change as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Most often throughout world history, families had worked together. All right? Mom and dad teach their children the skills they need to be good at their job. Their home life and their economic life are kind of connected together. But now the Industrial Revolution happens. Dad is not farming or working around the home. He is traveling to a factory. And when fathers work in factories, they're separated from their kids for many hours each day. And by 1830, most textile production, weaving, you know, cotton and, and wool into fabric, is done in a factory by machines. Here's Charlie Bucket's dad. These machines require workers with little or no skill. You just got to be there to provide labor. Machines are more important than people. If anybody watches this this weekend, remind me to tell you a story of my job at GKN. With fathers now gone up to 12, 14 hours a day, you got to do the work, plus you got to commute to and from home. Kids are no longer learning. They're no longer being taught by dad. They're not getting an education at home, rules, discipline, codes of behavior. And so now moms have got to find a way to do the work of both parents. And some poor families will send their children off to work in factories as well to get a little bit of extra income. You're not going to school, you're learning how to read, or you're not learning how to school to read and write, you're going to the factory to work. And so it's the plight of child labor that is on everybody's minds. It's well documented during the Industrial Revolution. What's going on? Since kids are no longer being taught by their parents, all right, they're here working in the factory, how are they learning what's right and what's wrong? Their education and discipline is transferred from the home or the school to the workplace. Here, you little urchin, get your hand in there and get that and like it. And so this brings up the English Factory Act of 1835. People said, this is just ridiculous. And the English Factory Act mandates that children could not work more than eight hours in one day. And after those eight hours, they had to attend two hours of schooling paid for by the factory. So you guys complain about being in my class for about an hour. Well, imagine going ahead and doing that. Now, it has to be mentioned that not all children 
worked in factories full time. Some of them who had fathers who were management or in upper levels of, you know, floor manager, line leader, were making more money as factory workers than they ever were as farmers. So some children no longer had to work at a young age like they had to out on the farm. Instead, they were able to go to school. And schooling is going to be the game changer. Right? When you are in school, you learn, hopefully, how to think. And the light bulb of knowledge kicks on in your head, and you've learned that you have been repressed for a long time, and you want to change things. So it is at this point that I'm going to stop. We're going to talk about women and Karl Marx in the Industrial Revolution in Part 2. All right, we'll see you guys soon.